Welcome back to Living History. Last week, we explored the life of Howard Hughes, a guy who flew faster planes than anyone, who ended his life hiding away from people and germs. Now we're going back to the 1800s to meet Charles Darwin, the man who came up with the idea of evolution. Mr. Darwin, it's great to have you on Living History. First, what did you think of Howard Hughes from last week? He, he wanted to control everything. Planes, movies, businesses. What do you think about that? Thanks, Casey. It's good to be here. Howard Hughes was an amazing man. I like how hard he worked to win, like animals fighting to live. He tried to control everything. Planes, firms, companies, films. I don't do that. I look at birds, bugs, rocks and try to see how nature works. I took notes on slow changes, but I do relate to his hiding. He locked himself in hotels, scared of germs and people. I hid at my house in Kent, sick and worried about what people would say. He crashed planes and kept going. I got sick, but kept studying. I admire him, he was bold. But I wonder, was he happy? Or did all that work make him miserable? Like mine sometimes did. Wow, yeah, interesting to hear your thoughts on Howard Hughes. Well, your life was full of trouble, disease, ridicule. Tell us your story, and then how you formed your great grand theory of evolution. Okay, Casey, here's my story, plain and simple. I was born February 12th in 1809 in Shrewsbury, England, in a big house. My dad, Robert Darwin, was a doctor with lots of money, and my mom, Susanna, came from the Wedgwood family that made fancy dishes. I had five brothers and sisters. When I was eight in 1817, my mom died. I missed her so much, it hurt every day. I went to Shrewsbury school, but it was boring. Too many books, not enough fun. In 1825, at 16, I tried being a doctor like my dad at Edinburgh, but cutting up dead bodies made me sick. I hated the smell and ran off. My dad sent me to Cambridge in 1828 to be a priest, but I didn't care about church. I collected beetles, studied plants, and loved rocks. In 1831, at 22, I got on a ship called the HMS Beagle for five years, sailing to South America. The waves made me puke every day, but I saw amazing things. In the Galapagos Islands, I found finches. Some had thick beaks for nuts, others thin ones for bugs. Tortoises looked different on each island. I thought, why aren't they all the same? I picked up birds, bones, and notes, trying to figure it out. Back in England, by 1836, I got really sick. I threw up all the time had headaches, and my heart raced. I felt weak, stuck in bed for days. Doctors didn't know why. Some said bad digestion. Others guessed wild things. People whispered I was faking it, too lazy to work. Some said God was punishing me for bad ideas. It was awful. I thought I'd die before I finished. Then in 1839, I married my cousin, Emma Wedgwood. We loved each other. But people gossiped, saying, that's wrong. It's like a sin. My dad even said marrying cousins might cause problems. We had ten kids, and I worried they'd get sick like me. The worst came when our baby Mary died in 1842, just weeks old. I felt so empty. Then my favorite daughter, Annie, got sick in 1851 at ten. I tried to help her and give her medicine, but she died of fever. I cried for days, blaming myself. Maybe my health or our marriage hurt her. In 1858, my little son Charles died too. I was so sad, feeling like a terrible father, useless and broken. I couldn't sleep. I just sat there hurting. Even with all that, I worked on my idea. On the beagle, I saw those finches and tortoises, different on each island. Step one was I wondered why. Step two was in 1838, I read a book by a man named Thomas Malthus. He said animals and people make too many babies, but there's not enough food, so some die. Step three, I thought, maybe the strongest ones live. Birds with the right beaks get food, others don't. Step four, I watched farmers breed pigeons. Some got big tails or fancy feathers because people picked them. Nature does that too. But slowly, 
I called it natural selection. The best animals survive, have babies, and pass on their traits. In 1842, I wrote it down. In 1844, I made a bigger plan. But Casey, to tell you the truth, I was scared. My idea said people came from animals, not God, that made us special. That was dangerous. My wife, Emma, was very religious. She prayed I wouldn't go to hell. I started losing my belief in God, and it upset me a lot. People might hate me, call me a liar. I got sicker, throwing up, shaking. I studied barnacles, tiny sea creatures, for eight years, scared to tell anyone. Then in 1858, a man named Alfred Russell Wallace sent me his idea. It was like mine. I panicked. Would he get all the credit? My friends helped us share the credit in 1858. I hurried and wrote my book, On the Origin of Species, in 1859. And here's why I believe it. I saw fossils, old bones showing fish turned into frogs, animals into people over millions of years. Baby animals looked like older ones from long ago. Finches changed to eat. It made sense. Nature picks winners, not God. But it was hard. Emma cried, I felt guilty, and I was afraid everyone would be mad. Then it got crazy. My book sold fast in 1859, but people got angry. A church leader, Bishop Wilberforce, yelled at me in a meeting in 1860, saying my idea was stupid. Man from monkeys? No way. Newspapers draw me as an ape, laughing at me. Some say I stole my idea from Wallace, called me a cheater. That wasn't true. I gave him credit. We shared the credit. But it hurt bad. People said my book ruined right and wrong. Man's just an animal now. I felt like a bad guy. I hid at my house in Kent, called down house. So sick and sad. Annie's death, Mary's, Charles, they broke my heart. I couldn't sleep, fell down, thought maybe I was wrong, a failure. Church people called me a devil, a god-hater. My hands shook, I, I stayed away from everyone. I just held on to Emma. But some liked it. Scientists wrote me, farmers too, saying I was brave. A friend, Thomas Huxley, fought for me. I kept going, wrote another book in 1871, Descent of Man, saying people came from animals. I was so sick, throwing up every day, heart racing. People still talked. Darwin's faking, he's cursed, he's bad. My marriage got them mad too, marrying a cousin and all. It was tough, but I kept working for the truth. I've had such sad losses and big fights, and a big idea. All right, now I'm gonna ask you a big question. Do you, Charles Darwin, think Christianity and the theory of evolution are reconcilable? Well, Casey, this is a profound question, and it's troubled me deeply, and I'll speak plainly with thoughts I've penned before. I see no good reason why the views given in my volume on evolution should shock the religious feelings of anyone, I wrote in 1859. But my voyage and study stirred doubts. The theory of natural selection has a grandeur from so simple a beginning endless forms of the most beautiful and most wonderful creatures. Now the Bible claims God made all in six days, man from dust. I said in The Descent of Man in 1871, man is descended from a hairy-tailed quadruped, probably arboreal in its habits. My faith was shook. I had gradually come by this time to see that the Old Testament, from its manifestly false history of the world, was no more to be trusted than the sacred books of the Hindus, or the beliefs of any barbarian, I confessed in my autobiography. When my daughter died, I wondered, why would God take her? I noted privately, I am not the least afraid of death, but faith faded. Disbelief crept over me at a very slow rate, but was at last complete. Can they join? Some say yes. A reverend, Charles Kingsley, wrote to me in 1863, seeing a lofty and pure theology in evolution. God might start life, set nature to work my way. I liked that, saying in origin, to my mind it accords better with what we know of the laws impressed on matter by the Creator that the production and extinction of the past and present inhabitants of the world should have been due to secondary causes. I didn't deny God outright, 
My theory shows facts. But I must admit, I cannot persuade myself that a beneficent and omnipotent god would have designedly created the Ichnomode with the express intention of their feeding within the living bodies of caterpillars. Those are small, small creatures. But I never ward on faith. Science has nothing to do with Christ, except insofar as the habit of scientific research makes a man cautious in admitting evidence, I said. If God used evolution, Christianity stands. If the Bible's exact word is exact, then my work jars. I own that I cannot see as plainly as others do evidence of design and beneficence on all sides of us. You weigh it for yourself, God or not. I feel most deeply that the whole subject is too profound for the human intellect. I lost faith, not to spite, but to truth. But in the end, Casey, I say yes, they are reconcilable, and eminently so. I will share with you some thoughts I wrote only a couple years before my death to a friend. It seems to me absurd to doubt that a man may be an ardent theist and an evolutionist. In my own case, I am quite certain that I am not an atheist, for in my most extreme fluctuations, I have never been an atheist in the sense of denying the existence of a god. I think that generally, and more and more as I grow older, but not always, that an agnostic would be the more correct description of my state of mind. What my own views may be is a question of no consequence to anyone but myself. But as you ask, I may state that my judgment often fluctuates. Moreover, whether a man deserves to be called a theist depends on the definition of the term, which is much too large a subject for one letter. Your work changed science forever. Tell us how you see your impact now, and what do you say to people who still think that you're wrong about the theory of evolution? My impact, Casey, is big and real, and I'm delighted to see it. My book on the origin of species sold out in 1859. People bought it fast, and it changed how we see life. Scientists use my idea. Biology books talk about how animals change. Geology shows old rocks with bones. And studies say people came from animals long ago. I messed up sometimes, and for a lot of my life I was scared, sad, and sheltered at home. I felt bad about my kids and Emma's worries, but I never lied or stole. I worked for years and shared my ideas. I hurt inside. To people who don't believe my theory, I say look at the proof. Fossils and rocks, fish bones, then frog bones, then ours. Baby chicks look like old lizards. Finches get better beaks to eat nuts. Farmers make pigeons fancy. Nature does that too. It picks the strong ones. I waited years, scared of church and people, but facts piled up. Scientists check it and agree. I didn't hate God. My belief got quiet. A sad thing for me. I lost a lot. My kids, my health, people's trust. I say this. I gave everything. Got sick, lost my family's peace for this. The theory of natural selection. I believe it. Nature changes life. Finches, fossils, and then us. It picks the best and keep going. It was hard. And to everyone listening, you look, learn, and keep going, even when it's tough to find the truth. What do you make of all the 20th century reformers who took your ideas and turned them into a social theory of how governments and societies should work? Of course, the Nazis, a lot of the 20th century progressive reformers, the eugenics laws, a lot of that came from a social idea applied from your biological notions. That only the fit, that only the strong should rule and survive. What do you make of that? Do you think it was a good application of your theory? Like, you're like, those guys are geniuses. Why didn't I think of that and kill all the disabled people? Or are you like, nah, nah, it's not, that's not for me. And on this subject, our Patreon guy Venata asks, in your work, The Origin of Species, the subtitle is Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. When you wrote that, did you also believe that some human races are of a higher hierarchy due to being more fit for survival? This social Darwinism, as they call it, I'm troubled. I never meant my ideas for people's societies, for ranking men or nations. I studied plants, animals, not governments. After my book, for folks like Herbert Spencer, he coined the term survival of the fittest in 1864, took my words and ran wild. They said the rich, the powerful, are the fit, 
meant to rule. The poor, the weak must fall. Nations, races got judged the same, some better, some to be crushed. I shudder at that. In The Descent of Man in 1871, I wrote, The aid which we feel impelled to give to the helpless is mainly an incidental result of the instinct of sympathy. I saw humans helping, caring, my theories about nature's fight. Not a law for cutting down the needy, but I see where they got their ideas. I said if the misery of the poor be caused not by the laws of nature, but by our institutions, great is our sin, in that book. And I feared that men would twist my words to excuse greed, cruelty leaving the sick, the poor to die. My heart sank at that. I hear Margaret Sanger, a woman in the early 1900s, spoke of stopping unfit folks, poor, sick, or different, from having kids, calling it better for society. She talked about eliminating the unfit and praised eugenics to breed better humans. And then Woodrow Wilson, your president, when he was governor, backed laws to sterilize feeble-minded individuals or criminals in New Jersey, using science to fix society. Worse, I hear that the Nazis took my words, natural selection, and bent them to a vile cause. They claimed some races their own were fittest and better than others, like Jews or gypsies. I lost my daughter at ten. I'd never say she was unfit and should perish. The thinkers took my ideas in places they were never meant. Some like Thomas Huxley, my friend, fought for me, taught evolution, called, he was called Darwin's bulldog. He saw science grow, and I'm glad. But others warped it. I hear of eugenics. Men like Francis Galton, my cousin, pushed breeding better people, weeding out the weak. I wrote in dissent, we civilized men do our utmost to check the process of elimination. We build asylums for the imbecile, the maimed, and the sick. My own health was frail, vomiting and headaches since the beagle. Would they call me unfit? It's a grim thought. My idea was observation, not a prescription for a society. They took it from my words like, We must, however, acknowledge that man, with all his noble qualities, still bears in his bodily frame the indelible stamp of his lowly origin. We're from animals, yes, but social Darwinism? It's a misuse. I never said the strong should trample the weak. Humans aren't finches scrapping for seeds. The moral sense perhaps affords the best and highest distinction between man and the lower animals. I will also add, this isn't just post hoc rationalization on my part, but even in my lifetime, I vehemently opposed slavery. I come from a family opposed to slavery. My grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, and my Wedgwood kin, including Josiah Wedgwood, were ardent abolitionists. I argued that all humans share a common origin, descending from a single stock likely in Africa. This unity of mankind, to my mind, renders any claim to justify slavery through notions of inherent inferiority baseless and repugnant. In fact, during my voyage on the Beagle, I witnessed the cruelties of slavery firsthand, particularly in South America, where I saw the brutal treatment of slaves. In my journal, I wrote of my disgust at the sight of men reduced to bondage, their families torn asunder, and their spirits crushed by the lash. I recall a moment in Brazil where I heard the cries of a slave under punishment and felt a profound indignation. That feeling never left me. And thank you, Casey, for giving me a chance today to share some of what I believed with your audience. Thank you for telling us all of this. To our listeners, if Charles Darwin's got you thinking, join us on Patreon to support living history. And thanks to our patrons Bob, Eric, Guy, and Matt for making this happen.